Welcome to Transform Now, the podcast brought to you by robotic process automation pioneer, Blue Prism. Digital transformation has the potential to reshape the way companies service their customers, engage their employees, and manage their operations. Whether you're looking to develop strategies, tactics, and best practices to positively impact the future of work, or you're curious to learn how other companies have successfully navigated their digital transformation programs, then this podcast is for you. We're here to help you transform now. Hello, everyone. I'm Brad Hairston with Blue Prism. Welcome to the Transform Now podcast. Today, I'm excited to have as my guest, Chin Moi, the Chief Revenue Officer of Glint, a U.S.-based AI company and a technology alliance partner of Blue Prism. I will be talking with Chin about how Glint is helping companies use intelligent automation to address new regulations around climate disclosures. Chin, welcome to the podcast. Please tell our listeners more about yourself. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Chin Mua, Chief Revenue Officer at Glint. 20 years in the enterprise software business and was actually formerly the Vice President of Innovation over at Blue Prism. So I'm glad to be back working with my, my former colleagues and specifically been doing a lot of interesting things around compliance and regulations in the ESG space. And so it's an up and coming new buzzword, I guess folks would be talking about ESG and sustainability and things like that, but it's really more about understanding how to be compliance, understanding the risk and understanding what the, the motivation is with the SEC pushing these new frameworks out. Excellent. Thank you, Chin. Well, for those not familiar with your company, with Glint, tell us more, tell us about your specific space in the ecosystem of intelligent automation. So Glint 10 years ago started out as an intelligent document automation service provider as a SaaS model and quickly evolved into managing energy, utilities, gathering information from those complex utility bills and contracts. And so with all these new regulatory requirements and Glint itself would be able to extract all kinds of data from it enrich that data uh, specifically off of EPA calculations or any known algorithms, and then provide carbon information to whoever needs to provide that in their 10K reports. And so think of it as a intelligent document capture embedded with intelligence, some machine learning enabled, some end-to-end -end processes that's been completely automated. And we, we're now serving it as data as a service to manage all those carbon emissions calculations and data offsets. You mentioned how Glint is heavily focused now on climate disclosures, which is a yeah. hot topic. And certainly governments and investors are raising the bar on the level of climate impact data that they're requiring to see from companies. And this is an extremely timely topic because just a few weeks ago, the Security Exchange Commissions issued a draft set of regulations that have everybody talking. Can you speak about these new reporting requirements that they put out there in the public domain and, and the impact they will have on companies in the US? Absolutely, and so traditionally, ESG numbers, carbon emissions offsets, carbon emissions uh, reporting has been more on a voluntary basis. But what's been happening lately over the past 12 to 18 months is that you have the shareholders, you have the hedge funds, You've got a lot of the banking finance folks asking, where do these numbers come from? In many cases, it's an offshore person typing it into a spreadsheet and somehow or another, it ends up on a 10K. And so with all the climate risk situations, hurricanes, typhoons, even some geopolitical situations that we're having now between Russia and Ukraine, many of these shareholders are asking, how does climate impact your business? How does that impact your supply chain? I need to understand that risk because it may impact how I'm going to manage my funds as far as from an ETF or even a fund manager. And so they're asking a lot of this from the SEC. And so the SEC is turning around saying, well, we don't really know how to do this. So what they went and did is they went actually went out to the TCFD and, and that's a whole nother or global organization of 90 countries that have put some climate regulations together to define what scope one, scope two, and scope three, and we'll go into more details what that means, but it's really requiring a lot of these public companies to disclose the risk of their business due to climate and, and supply chain risk. So 
that's really what's driving this. I know there may be some political angles to this, as we all know uh, here in the States, but it's really driving where the money's going to go and how do, we're going to reprice and recategorize what value is in the future. On the positive side of being able to report your carbon emissions data on your 10K is that there are actually hedge funds out there, specifically BlackRock and many others like them, that are willing to sponsor alternative credit or access to capital just by showing that you are reducing your carbon emissions. So what's interesting about that is that there's many places around the world, and I'll call out Japan, they are providing a zero interest loan to companies that are reducing their carbon emissions, but they're requiring that carbon emissions data to be finance grade, to have audits, traceability, where did it come from, to be able to underwrite a lot of these new access to capital markets. So if I was a CFO, now I have a couple of ways to get financing for my company. I can do a debt equity financing, which is the typical traditional model, or I could leverage my carbon emissions data to go out and in essence sell how good I am in managing my carbon emissions to get access to alternative millions of dollars to either do sustainability upgrades to my, my facility, open new markets, whatever those business strategies may be in the future to deploy this, I now have that way of doing that. And that's something that the CFOs that we're educating on, on our customer base start to appreciate the fact that it's harder and harder now, especially now with inflation rates going up, that it might be better to start looking at alternative capitals and access to off book dollars. Yep. It's exciting. Interesting. What is the potential future impact of the SEC climate disclosure and how it affects business today. Can you speak to that? So we're working with many of the large property leasing companies, management companies. So we'll give you an example. They're starting to understand the consumption of energy in a, in a building and how that energy is being used to service their specific customers. So think of a, a Walmart with thousands of locations and they have to report, you know, their energy consumptions to create and, and manage their products and services. And so many of this stuff is actually very difficult to do because if you have a building in New York, you might be using ut utilities that's burning coal, but you may also have the building facilities in California that might be solar powered. And those CO2 coefficient numbers and the waste that it's being produced from those CO2 uh, emissions will be very different. In many cases, customers of ours need it down to the line item detail, and in many cases, down even to the meter. So you're getting a per square foot calculations of greenhouse gases for a building, and that may also line up to a skew on your P&L. So it's very interesting that we're starting to really understand how resources, carbon emissions, carbon offsets is being consumed, produced by a public company. And beyond that, what's interesting is that this is actually also uh, affecting the private equity markets because some of these companies are looking to go IPO through mergers and acquisitions. And so they're leveraging these new draft standards to do a lot of their carbon reporting as well. You talked a little bit about this, but I wonder if you could just go into more detail about what makes these climate disclosures that are spelled out by the new SEC regulations, what makes them so complicated to fulfill? Oh, yeah, that's so that's a great question because there's really three scenarios in this 500 page plus SEC draft. <laughs> I, I've had the pleasure to read it a couple of times. I will tell you, it's a very interesting reading. Yeah, but I can imagine. It, it, it actually really boils down to three major categories. First of all, you have to gather your actuals. So there needs to be a baseline understanding that when you report actual carbon emissions and your greenhouse gases, that it lines up to a specific building's line item details, p &L, whatever those general accounting practice codes may be. And that's really hard because as you think about all the thousands of different utility companies in the U.S. and even the different commodities like natural gas, water, so waste, so anything that, that requires any kind of reporting that is material to your business, that actual number is very difficult to do, especially if you're a, a large organization. So that's one scenario. So collecting it, gathering it, calculating it, to a specific general account. The second scenario is that I have to now, as a company, disclose how much climate risk is to my company. So let's say there's a tornado in Dallas and I happen to have my headquarters in Dallas. What is that percent chance and how strong is my P&L forecasting in testing those scenarios? So I have to report not only the 
worst case scenario, but what is my transitory risk in that? So if there's material risk to that, you're going to have to disclose that to your investors. And so that's very interesting now, because obviously in the news, we're hearing the, that there may be a shortage of food and supply chains and logistics and fuels and things like that due to inflation. So you got to fa factor all those calculations back into your business operation. And the third scenario is, is that there's a transitory risk. So if you're thinking about having your actuals being reported, and then you're forecasting a reduction of your CO2 emissions, what does that plan look like? How did you model that plan? And what are the actual operational exercises you're going to put in place? In many cases, this is where the GSIs, the global consulting services firms will come in with their sustainability teams and transformation teams and help facilitate that. And so when I look at this, I think there's a great opportunity for automation on the data collection piece, the modeling piece, the analytics, as well as tracking where all these new offsets, new reduction plants, if they're actually material to that business, but that's what the shareholder wants. And those folks who are being transparent with their carbon emissions and lining to their business and having all these plans in place, they're seeing anywhere from a two to 5% increase of their share price just by being transparent and just by showing that there's a plan in place. And that's what the shareholders are voting with. They're voting with their money and they're voting with those dollars to be, invest into these companies. So when you, to, to answer your question directly, what's going to happen? There's going to be a great filtering of companies who are very resource efficient versus the companies who are not. And those who are efficient with their internal resources and managing their emissions and greenhouse and all these different things, they're going to be the one that, who gets the higher valuations. And we're already starting to see that in the market space today. And Chin, I know before you did automation and AI, you were a BI and analytics guy. So you have a great appreciation for the data harmonization and cleansing and aggregation issues. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably one of the hardest attributes right now because you have right now, the only way to really do this is to hire very expensive consultants, mainly enter into stuff into the spreadsheet. And then not only that, but every month you have to go back and update those data in a regular governing way. And right now there's just not a way to do that. Yeah. Wow. Jen, will these new regulations and others similar to them outside the U.S., will they put climate risk on the list of priorities for the CFO, in your opinion? Oh, absolutely. So uh, there was a re recent article I just read just before jumping on this podcast here that 95% of all earnings call has had the word ESG in it. <laughs> ESG, sustainability, climate risk. Yep. Those three words are one of the top discussions right now at the boardroom level. In many cases, organizations are behind the eight ball because either they have been reporting it, but they don't know how good the numbers are, or they don't know how to even audit and the where to start. So those are definitely concerns at the boardroom level. Right. And aside from the regulatory aspect, why is it becoming more important for companies to fully disclose their climate risk and their policies? We, in, in, in this 21st century, I think there's a bit of a social economics perspective. There's, a, there's definitely a, a psychological perspective. But I think what's happening is the fact that there are more people on the planet. Mm -hmm. There are pressures on, on top of government agencies and countries, governing bodies, to manage the resources more effectively, more efficiently because of that. I think a uh, perfect example is with you know, the conflict with Russia and Ukraine. That's a perfect example but that you have conflict that will disrupt the supply chain. You have issues around the planet that we are so globalized that is dependent on manufacturing in overseas to get your products onshore. And so what investors are starting to realize is they're starting to ask the question of what's in your supply chain? How are you managing those expectations? Because you're releasing a new model car for next year and you can't get all your parts and pieces. You're not going to make your forecast. And if you're not going to make your forecast, I shouldn't be investing in you because that's a risk to my dollars. So there's a lot of uh, connecting the dots along the way. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe that it's an integration between supply chain policy. It's an environmental conscious now. I think we're all more aware of our contribution to the environment. But really, it, it all boils down to the dollars and cents and moving that forward to mm. making sure that the investors get the return that they're wanting. If these new SEC regulations get finalized, when would they take effect in the U.S.? 
right now, by just looking at the timeline, it may be by the end of this year. So hmm. in this first 60 days when they had issued this draft, they're actually asking for the industries and feedback from uh, folks like you and I, from industry experts as well, to, to ask those questions. The hard question is, how hard is it to start to provide regulatory compliance to meeting these new rules and guidelines? In that 500-page document, the SEC projected that there will be an in internal cost of 500,000 US dollars for an average public company. You and I, who have done consulting, we know that <laughs> that's a very low ball <laughs> number. We know what it's going to be. It's probably going to be closer to the seven, mid seven digit numbers for yeah. a public company to manage these regulatory requirements. And so I look at it as an opportunity to leverage emerging technologies to solve some of these problems and to allow our customers to benefit from automation by doing so. So there isn't a seven uh, digit expense cost just to comply with these new regs and rules. At the same time, I think there's an opportunity for us to provide feedback to Congress where we still mm -hmm. live in a uh, democracy where we can provide that, that feedback. Once that feedback is in place, I think it's going to go to the Banking Senate Committee. They're going to have some more discussions. There may be some retractions of certain parts of the uh, framework because there is a scope one, scope two, and scope three. So scope one is more about energy storage. Scope two is more about how you and your business use energy and resources to produce your product, service, and goods. And then scope three is really the hard part. It is actually 50 times more complex than scope two, and that is really understanding your carbon emissions inside your supply chain. So Think about every line item detail inside an invoice that your company consumes, those 10 million pencils that Walmart uses every day, there should be a carbon number that's associated with each one of those units of material. And so that becomes a massive undertaking. In talking to our board and, and the folks that at Glenn's who are very close to this, we believe there might be a, a negotiation of making taking scope three off of this uh, framework. And then it's more about just understanding the commodities like natural gas, water, utilities, and things like that, that a business needs to provide their products and services, because that's actually a little easier to get to the data. So that's what we're seeing. And so you fast forward probably by the end of the year, it'll probably get into yeah. to the rule. And then after that, there may be an 18 to 20 month ramp up so that public companies can start to meet these requirements. Or and in some cases, those early adopters may want to leverage it and say, and use it as a marketing campaign and say, look, hey, we, we're heading to net zero and here's our plan. We've got automation in place. Then your stock price should be increasing by two to 5% for, just because of that. The SEC piece is obviously just applicable to the U.S., but what's the, what does it look like outside of the U.S.? I know some regions are, are a bit ahead of the U.S. in terms of regulations and reporting requirements like this, but could you just speak to that as sure. well? Sure. So Glenn is, an, is a global organization and many of our customers are global in nature as well. And so uh, talking about the EMEA region itself, so any company that uh, has revenue over 20 million euros has to report their carbon emissions accurately on their public filing. Asia PAC is coming right behind that. So what's interesting is the U.S. is the lagger in this situation, but what the U.S. has done is that they're using the framework from all the other 90 countries as a litmus test to see what can be done, what should be done, and then what's appropriate for U.S. companies to do. So we're starting to see a, a coalesce of all these different regs into one. And what's interesting is that if you are U.S.-based companies and you have divisions overseas, in these parts of the world, depending on the requirements of that country or in that region, you might have to do more reporting, more detailed reporting versus what's happening in the States. So there's going to be a little bit of differences probably for the next 18 to 24 months, but overall it's going to be about the same data. Wow. Okay. So we've talked a lot about what these new climate disclosures um, are and what they mean to companies. Now let's talk about Glint's response and how you guys have come forward with a specific solution that taps into your AI, your IDP capabilities. Yep. So give us the overview of that, if you would. So in Glint's a technology stack, we are cornered on a, what we call is the small footprint of machine learning. We license actually the top OCR engines out there. So folks are very familiar with Abby, AWS, Google, and so forth. And what we've been able to do is train multiple OCR engines, as well as one of our own, to understand and get the best accuracy based upon the types of documents that's coming in. So, for example, handwriting. What we use is Google because it happens to be one of the best OCR engines for handwriting. 
if we're talking about unstructured data, it might be the AWS or maybe Abby, depending on the type of documents that comes in. So our AI and ML models knows when to apply the appropriate OCR engine to that. So that's kind of a bit of our secret sauce. But what's also very unique is we have our OCR engines with embedded technology, embedded intelligence, meaning it's been tuned and been trained on all kinds of utility information. So our data set is 3,800 of all the utility <laughs> providers in the US. So chances are, if we meet a customer in the States, the first question they always ask is, how much data set do I need to train? I, I usually say three to five documents and they're just blown away. So. Three to five document scans, we're at 99% accuracy. And so what's also unique about this is that depending on the document and depending on the type of disclosures you're looking to release with your public filing, you may need more or you may need less data from that bill, from that utility, that invoice, whatever it might be. So we can actually extract the data and actually contextualize it based upon the time of day, the kilowatt usage, and then align that back to where the power came from. And on that day, where, was it the windmill that was turning or was it a natural gas that was actually burning? So we can correlate that data with our ML models back to the source. And that's what we talk about when we say finance grade emissions, because it is always tied back to a data point that can be audited and can be validated because what's happening today is, again, some random person types it in a spreadsheet and you just don't know. So this is where the CFO needs to really understand the Office of Finance that we're mirroring, we're, we're bridging the gap between what sustainability policy departments are doing with finance, because there is a major disconnect between right now between those two different departments. Sustainability folks come in with policy, they come up with great ideas to reduce, but there's got to be dollars and cents and trackability and audibility behind that. And that's really where the compliance is from the finance side. So. Finance folks understand compliance, sustainability folks understand policy, and we're just trying to bridge that gap and getting them talking together. So that's our technology stack. And one more thing on top of that, there is a data enrichment piece where when I was talking about the embedded intelligence, not only are we calculating the CO2 coefficient numbers and everything else, but we're actually formatting the data back to the source system. So if you need it to be an SAP, you need it to be an Oracle, Microsoft sustainability applications modules, those things are just an API way. So for us, it's end to end. And what's the beauty about working with Blue Prism here is the fact that we provide the data, yes, but we don't do the financial close process. You still need Blue Prism to come in and do this financial close process. You still need Blue Prism to look at the numbers that are coming across and say, Mr. Customer, you might want to turn off from midnight to four o'clock in the morning. Do you really need those diesel generators in the back keeping the, the, the buildings cool? So you have that kind of capabilities where you can automate the operations above and beyond the stuff that we're doing just from the data collection and being able to do that with. So that's where I think this relationship between Blue Prism and, and Glint is very important is the fact that you guys can do the oper operational sides of it. You guys can leverage and get things done. We just provide the data and analytics to do that with. And of course, you guys are a, a tap partner of yep. Blue Prism, so we have a connector to your technology. I think the beauty of this is the fact that we can get the, the data to the bots to then mm -hmm. do something with. And that's right. really interesting because now you, you're completely automating the entire resource management of a building, of mm -hmm. a facility, and those type of things that this has never been done before. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, that's a really compelling solution, Chin, and I applaud you guys for getting ahead of the curve like you have. So where can people go to learn more about Glint? We just released three new white papers today, but so you can go and get it. It's at www.glint.ai. Excellent. Chin, thank you for joining me today. I have learned a lot in this podcast. Just hearing you explain what's going on in this space around climate disclosures and these new regulations in the U.S., but it's not, not a surprise to hear that this is something that is affecting companies all around the world. And it's really neat to hear what your company is doing and how you're leveraging your AI to address this. And it's really exciting to know that as a partner of Blue Prisms, we can go at this problem together and, and really complement each other. So thank you for spending time with us and sharing. And I wish you the best. Be well. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care.
Thanks for tuning in to Transform Now. For more insightful discussions on digital transformation and more, check out our podcast channel where you'll find all of our previous episodes. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. And if you like what you heard, please leave us a review. For more information about digital transformation and the future of work, check out blueprism.com to learn how Blue Prism's digital workforce is enabling enterprise transformation now.